I've been working on Indian school research for a long time, as Lindsay has mentioned. And um, more recently, my interest has shifted to the stories of athletes <coughs> at the Carlisle Indian School. Um, for those of you who haven't heard me talk before or don't know about the Indian School, we know of about eight, a little over 8,000 children who attended the school. And I always start these talks asking you to superimpose a map of the United States over this image. And imagine Alaskan children from the Northwest, Mission from California, and as you scan across this image or the map, you had students from virtually every single federally recognized Indian nation. And there are about, I think, 570 now. And almost all were represented at the Carlisle Indian School. So when you think of who these children were, this is a virtual United Nations of nations coming together in Carlisle between 1879 and 1918. And the school was um, an industrial training school, which meant that Students took coursework in academics for half a day and then learned a trade for the other half a day, some kind of vocational trade. And part of that process was the so-called outing system because when students were enrolled at the Indian school, they were typically enrolled for a period of five years. And during that time, they never went back to their home communities. Almost all the children enrolled at Carlisle came from a reservation or an agency. And there were none in Pennsylvania between 1879 and since. So these children came from pretty far away. The closest would have been from up in New York State, the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois nations. And so in the summertime, when you would expect a kid to go home from boarding school, these children were sent out, with a capital O, out into non-native families, where they lived with those families for three months. Some children lived longer. Some, some were there for a year, 18 months at a time, and actually going to public school with their non-native siblings. So this was an integral part of the process of assimilation, which was the purpose of the Carlisle Indian School, to assimilate Native American Indian children into the European culture. Um, so that involved speaking English, English only was the rule, and it involved being assigned to some Christian uh, denomination and pretty much um, getting rid of anything uh, that came out of the traditional culture and replacing it with European American culture. So, you know, I know, I know you all have heard this before because I usually start these kind of talks with that introduction. So now, looking at outing, um, I recently started putting together a spreadsheet of all the outings that I could gather from the database of an anthropologist who did her research on the Carlisle Indian School in the early 1990s. She went through all of the student records that are housed at the National Archives, and she identified who the outing patrons were and where they were located and the lengths of stay for each child. And so my spreadsheet right now is showing 15,000 outings. Yeah, and that doesn't just include going into farm families or families. That includes being sent into um, some industries. For example, the Ford Motor Company had quite a lot of young men on outing in the 1910s that were sent to Dearborn, <coughs> Michigan and worked for the Ford factory. Henry Ford had a school for immigrants, and some of these kids were uh, eligible to be part of that training process. Uh, the Hershey Chocolate Factory had boys on outing that worked in the factory, and they also happened to be ex exceptional baseball players. 
And in the summertime, they were playing on Hershey's baseball team and competing with other teams. And there were girls who were working in some of the executives' homes in Hershey. So that's just a small example. There also were students who were sent out into various normal schools. Westchester Normal School, Shippensburg Normal School, Millersville. Um, and so they, were, they tended to be females who were taking some kind of teacher training. But what I want to focus on is Boiling Springs. Um, if you, you know, and I think over at Dickinson College, um, Jim Grenzer, who is the archi archivist there, and a team of people have put together a digitization project. And one of the aspects that they were looking at and that they started working on was mapping these outings. So, you know, I think eventually there will be a map available that can show you where outings, you know, were located. But the, the vast majority of, majority of these outings were in Berks County and Bucks County and places where they had really high Quaker populations because Quaker <coughs> families were probably in Pratt's eyes. Pratt, Richard Henry Pratt was the founder of the Carlisle Indian School. Those families were most desirable for these Indian kids because they, they were temperate. They, they celebrated temperance and they did not swear, um, and they spoke good English, you know, and it was kind of the ideal setup. Um, in Boiling Springs, the, the families who had children, and these are not young children, as you'll see from the spreadsheet, um, on outings were really mostly working in farms. Um, so, the other thing I wanted to mention before we start looking at these families and who the kids were in those homes um, is sort of an, an introduction to what the outing contract would have been. And there's an example of that contract up there. So every child or young person, young adult, who was sent out made a contract with the outing patron who would be the farmer or the factory owner or um, if it was a, a woman who had a, wanted a girl in her house for the summer to go to New Jersey to the shore, you know, she would be the one who signed that contract. And it, it was between the superintendent of the school, the outing patron, and the outing student. And the rules for outing kind of shifted in time, but um, in this list that we have here, it emphasizes that um, children have to bathe once a week, that they can't smoke or drink on outing, that they have to save half of their earnings and um, help to pay for their transportation to and from the outings, um, and, and they can't go to Philadelphia. <laughs> no point to Philadelphia, that was a big taboo. There was danger in Philadelphia. <laughs> So anyways, and, and I have copies of the, these outing contracts if you ever want to see one. Um, and of course, the boys would be working in the fields, working in the shops, you know, doing um, labor of some sort. And girls on outing would be doing what you would expect a genteel young girl or young woman to be doing uh, in the household, cooking, cleaning, sewing, child care, laundry, um, so that, those were what the outing entailed at, around the turn of the century. Um, so, and, and the school was very interested in keeping track of who was on outing and who wasn't on outing, and they published little news items about kids who were out in their farm homes or in their country homes so that their schoolmates could kind of follow where they were and pay attention to, um, you know, what kids were up to on outing. So this particular outing or article talks about um, how there were 62 girls attending public schools on outing. So when you think about that, um, you know, these girls who were in public schools and boys in some cases, um, were not getting paid by their outing families. If they were out in the summer and working in the fields, they were paid a minimum wage that, would, like I said, they were required to save part of. But um, 
If they were attending public school, they were living in the family working for their room and board. So they were kept on the books at the Carlisle Indian School. They were enrolled at the school, but they weren't physically at the school. And you can imagine the kind of cons concerns that would, would, would um, bring up among parents who wanted to know where their kids were and why, you know, why haven't I heard from my child? Because children were required to write home letters at least once a month, and they were required to do that on outing as well. So, you know, there are just all kinds of implications uh, that go along with this system, which was unique to Carlisle. You should know Carlisle Indian School was the first federally funded off-reservation boarding school that was developed exclusively for Native American Indian children or young folks. And you're going to hear me use the term Indian from now on because, you know, I'm not going to get into that political issue about our Native American Indian, but, you know, it was called the Indian School, so that's what I'm going to use. Um, so, uh, and they were in uh, Mar mostly Maryland, Pennsylvania. There were some students that were out in Ohio. There were some students that were out in Massachusetts, New York State, but they were generally in the northeastern part of the country. Now, Boiling Springs was not just a place where boys were sent <coughs> for an outing. It was also a really popular recreational site, as, as of course it still is. I know I remember taking my kids to the Boiling Springs <coughs> Lake when they were little and feeding the ducks. And, you know, at the Indian School, that was a popular place to go. And um, in September of 1893, the Cumberland Valley Electric Powered Rail Line was um, set up to, to travel from Main Street in Carlisle um, and then out the York Road into Boiling Springs. So there was easy access to go on outings in Boiling Springs and, of course, to Mount Holly, Mount Holly Springs. And that, that's another program, the Holly Outings. Um, but there were these trolley excursions to Boiling Springs from the Indian School, and they were very popular among teachers and for student outings. And they also, their picnics were also popular outing activities. And the Carlisle Indian School had an annual picnic, and sometimes that picnic was held at Boiling Springs Park. Um, I don't know if this is a familiar photo to you all. This was one of the bridges. Um, that connected the spring to Boiling Springs Lake. I don't know, is, I get, is that still there? No. No? Foundation. Uh-uh, okay. Um, another uh, part of the Indian School, um, another feature that was really important was the photographs that were taken of Carlisle Indian School students. And um, Choate, John Choate, who was the earliest photographer who, um, for, from whom we have many collections of photos in our collections, um, the National Anthropological Archives at the Smithsonian has the Choate collection, um, Dickinson College has some Choate collection. All, all of these photos are very critical to our interpretation in telling the stories of the life of the school, not to mention the, descent, the many descendants who come and get photos of their relatives who went to the Indian school. Um, and Choate actually had a traveling photo studio <coughs> that he set up at the lake in Boiling Springs. Um, and so I thought I'd show you that picture. Here's another photo of a house at Boiling Springs. This was the Lewis Otto house on Front Street. And I just, it piqued my curiosity because um, Charles uh, W. Otto was um, the Boil Boiling Springs farmer, patron, who probably had the most Indian school students in his um, establishment. So I don't know if this is a relative or not. Maybe you all know. Does anybody know who this Otto was related to Charles? Okay. Um, so here, this is part of the spreadsheet that you have. These are all of the outing families and Indian school students who were assigned to um, 
those patrons all in Boiling Springs. And I just want to tell you who they are in a nutshell. Three Alaskan, one Apache, one Cherokee, one Cheyenne, two Chippewa, one Delaware, five Mohawk, one Oneida, two Onondaga, one Ottawa, four Paiute, one Pawnee, one Pima, one Puerto Rico, one San Paul, two Seneca, two Shawnee, seven Sioux, four Tuscarora, one Walla Walla, and one Wyandotte. So there's your United Nations of students living in Boiling Springs over that like roughly 20 year period. Uh, so in Boiling Springs, we're gonna start with the only student who was sent out with the Bayshore family. Um, and his name was Narcissus Prettyface. And he lived with and worked for three different families in Boiling Springs. He was the only student I found that had multiple outings in Boiling Springs. He was with the Bayshores, the Bookers, and the Ottos. And according to his student file, he arrived at the Carlisle Indian School at the age of 12 in the summer of 1901, and within a year, he worked at two of those farms in Boiling Springs. In the fall of 1903, while at the Otto Farm, he would have attended public school in Boiling Springs. After a total of five outings, three in Boiling Springs, one in New Jersey, and his final 15-month stint in eastern Pennsylvania, he deserted, and according to the press clipping that you see here, must have returned to South Dakota. He would have been from South Dakota. Uh, and then he worked in Ohio for a few days. So there is a story there that, you know, we don't really know. By 1909 and 1910, he was in South Dakota farming ostensibly where his deceased parents had lived. So he very likely would have had an allotment on that Crow Creek Reservation, probably 160 acres um, of land that would not have been suitable for farming, but would have been suitable for ranching. Most of the Lakota um, people who came through Carlisle ended up ranching on their um, allotments. Um, so, we're, oh, so he got to Ohio, then he was in Colorado by 1914, according to the article. This article captures the dilemma of the conflicts Carlisle students experienced after having spent five plus years at the Indian school. Um, so from this clipping, we also know from his student file that he was living back in the Crow Creek Reservation by 1915, which was a full 14 years after enrolling in Carlisle. So this, this uh, photo, this article is found in Narciss Pretty Face's student file, which is online on the Dickinson College Carlisle Indian School project site, which is a project by which they have um, scanned and uploaded thousands of materials from files of students of the Carlisle Indian School. And we are finding that we are making a lot of connections with descendants through these digitized files. So, you know, there is incredible interest in this topic right now. You know, I always thought when I started doing this, this was something I'd be interested in for a short time and then, you know, kind of wane. But it has just exploded information and interest in this. Uh, topic and more and more descendants are finding the names of their relatives who went to the Indian school through these kinds of projects. So, you know, the stories are coming back and, and it's really a very exciting time. This is the home of Thomas Jefferson Bradley. He lived in this farmhouse. Um, and it was listed in the Carlisle Indian School records with a Boiling Springs address. Now this farm 
um, after Bradley sold it to the Maslin family. This is where Doc Maslin lived, over on Old York Road. Do y'all recognize that property right along the Yellow Breaches Creek? I believe Dr. Stoken lives there now. This farm, um, but it was owned by T.J. Bradley, who's, um, if you all know Jim Bradley, he's a member here, and he was the photographer for the uh, Harrisburg Patriot News for many years. His wife, Mary, was a reporter there. This is the family homestead that he remembers as a kid. And, you know, a lot of people would maybe call this the Craighead area. And there were farms that were identified as Craighead addresses that are also um, another uh, possible program, I'm sure, because there were a lot of kids that were out in Craighead. Um, so these are the boy, I'm calling them boys. You know, they're young men. They're, you know, in their early 20s, late teens. So um, there were six students. Um, five of them left the Carlisle Indian School, and, and they would have had other outings in between this outing, outing with the Bradleys. Um, but the reason that they left is always interested, interesting to me. I mean, why did children leave the school? Did they graduate? Did they, was their time up? Did they run away? Did they die? We know some died because there's a cemetery over at the barracks. Um, so in, in the Boiling Springs, or in the Bradley group, five uh, left because their time had expired, and one ran away, and that was Joseph Kakagon, who's listed on this. Um, Thomas Mayo, who's on this list, he's very interesting to me, and I talked about him when I did the program on the Gettysburg Railroads, because he ended up working for the Battlefield Photograph Company in Gettysburg. So he was actually involved in providing photographs for descendants of Gettysburg heroes. And, um, you know, he, so he, he also worked on the Bradley Farm at one point. Um, we have George Gates. So he's on this list. He was 16 when he was with the Bradleys, and he went home to Fort Yates, North Dakota in June 1909, and he became a rancher and farmer there. Again, one of those Sioux kids who had um, an allotment in South Dakota, North Dakota. Thomas Mayo, I mentioned, he returned to Utah July 4th, 1907, but then he re-enrolled in August, and he worked for the Craigheads, and also, as I mentioned, for the Gettysburg uh, photographer. Uh, Joseph Kakason was 21. He came to Carlisle from Odenaw, Wisconsin, so he would have been Oneida or Menominee. No, Odenaw, he would have been Chippewa, Bad River Chippewa. Um, and he ran away from the outing after Bradley's and was sent home in bad health and died of consumption very shortly thereafter. Then you have Toad Tillahash, he was Paiute, 20 years old. He left Carlisle for Utah where he took up farming and he enjoyed subscribing to the school newspapers after he left the school. If you look through that uh, Dickinson Project site, if you're curious about the Indian School or want to explore this more, you know, you'll find a lot of correspondence from students writing back to the school asking for subscriptions to the Indian School newspapers, because they want to find out where their friends are and what their friends are up to. And you know, the papers always reported little vignettes about students and where they ended up. Um, then you had Clarence Smith, he was Arapaho, so he would have been um, from, he actually was Northern Arapaho from Montana, um, and he was an orphan from the Wind River Res, and after he spent a year at the Bradley Farm, he was detailed to the bakery at the Indian School. Now, if you've ever taken a tour over there and know, you know, how the, the school is organized, um, because it was an industrial training school, kids would have also learned different trades, um, baking, cooking. Um, the school was kind of, at one point, fairly self-sufficient, so he would have been baking for the school. 
Um, you have 22-year-old Clyde Roanchief, who was Pawnee. He was brought to Carlisle by Stacy Matlock. Um, and I don't know if you know the story of Stacy Matlock. He was, he was the athlete, one of the earliest football players at Carlisle. When uh, the Carlisle Indian School first started featuring football games and teams, this young man, Stacy Matlock, broke his leg. And um, if you've ever read Linda Whitmer's book, she has a story about how when he broke his leg, Pratt, the founder of the school, said, that's it, no more football at Carlisle. I'm trying to teach you to be gentlemen, mm -hmm. not to run around and knock each other out and hurt each other, you know. And so the boys at the Indian school got up a petition and petitioned Pratt to let them play football, and they promised they would never slug, they would play gentlemanly football, they would show, show people, you know, that football is not a savage sport, but can be played. And that's when Pratt actually hired Pop Warner to teach kids how to play football. So it changed from a game that was just this mass of testosterone moving up and down the field to a game that was organized with plays. If you want to know more about that, we sell a book in our shop called um, The Real All-Americans by Sally Jenkins. And I would highly recommend it because she describes how football, as we know it today, and certainly this is relevant because we just had our Super Bowl weekend, um, Football as we know it today was developed at the Carlisle Indian School through these plays that Pop Warner taught these young men who were not really big, huge, strapping guys, but they were very quick and very cunning. And under his tutelage, they were beating Ivy League teams. So, you know, those are the teams that put Carlisle on the map. But I digress, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but I wanted just to note that uh, none of these young men graduated from the Carlisle Indian School, which is not that uh, significant since most students did not graduate from Carlisle. Um, and because, you know, they did not, and, and how many of your great grandpas and grandmas graduated from high school? Um, you know, it was not as common then. And it did, you know, unless they earned a certificate of graduation and were on a track to go uh, to higher education, they came out with a certificate in blacksmithing, tinsmithing, baking, sewing and laundry, you know, that kind of thing. Um, the statistics that we've been uh, repeating, which seemed to still be the same, is out of the total population of the Carlisle Indian School, we know of 758 who graduated. So that kind of tells you something about the level of training, not just at Carlisle. Here are Mr. and Mrs. Bradley. Um, uh, T.J. Bradley is buried in the Mount Holly Springs Cemetery. So, um, The Booker family. The Bookers purchased the ironworks from the All, um, Carrie All, AHL, who owned the ironworks. And then um, that was in 1886. Right after that, Mr. Booker, Jared C. Booker, married Helen Hall Mullen. And then the furnace was operational in January. Um, and then in 1894, the um, they outfit the Boiling Springs Mansion with steam heat, and Jared Booker was elected to the board of directors of the Cumberland Valley Electric Ra Passenger Railway Company. So that could have something to do with the track line to Boiling Springs. Um, in 1900, after 14 years of marriage, the Bookers employ a Carlisle Indian School student, Frank Mount Pleasant. So he worked for the Bookers. Here's another picture of the Booker Mansion, which still stands up on the hill um, and is still owned by the Booker family. I believe, oh no, I guess not. No, not anymore. It was when I first moved here many years ago. <laughs> um, so the Bookers had four Indian school boys in their home, ages 14 to 18, for three and a half years from July 1900 to January 1904. 
Um, one of those boys, well, I mentioned Frank Mount Pleasant, and I'll tell you a little about him, because he was a very well-known student at Carlisle. And, um, you know, those of you who may have come to our conference uh, a couple months ago, or who have heard me talk about Carlisle, you know, I tend to sometimes be very hard-hitting about this experiment, which is often now couched in terms of cultural genocide and, you know, very hard-hitting um, perceptions of descendants whose relatives went to the school. Um, Frank Mount Pleasant family do not have that attitude about the Carlisle School. And Ed Farnham, who was stationed at the War College not too long ago, um, his grandpa was uh, Mamie Mount Pleasant and his uncle was Frank Mount Pleasant. And he recently gave a talk at our conference about how much his family loved and benefited from the Carlisle Indian School. Did I do that? Yeah. <laughs> what did I do? <laughs> Okay, um, and so that's significant, and I believe that that um, talk that he gave is something you can access through our website. If you go to uh, historicalsociety.com, thank you, maybe, maybe. connecting, <laughs> um, and and I urge you to do that because you know you you hear such a variety of response from people who. Um, are talking about their relatives at the Carlisle School. Another one of the students in the Booker family was Ed Fox, and I had never heard this story before until I started looking at this, um, his student file. Ed, Ed Fox, who was Shawnee from Oklahoma, married a local, a local Carlisle girl, and that, you know, you don't see many stories like that, except for maybe um, Monty Yuda whose grandson is sitting with us. That's the other, you know, exception to that. But um, he married a local girl, and they had two children, and they lived over on um, West North Street. But then Edward got his allotment in Oklahoma, his 160 acres. So they moved out to Oklahoma, but his wife was so homesick, and their property was not um, farming, farmable. And so he wasn't able to survive. And so then they came back to Carlisle. And last I saw, they were living on East South Street across from the cemetery. So I'm not sure where that story goes. Maybe some of you might know eventually. Oh, I'm not up yet. Okay. But that's okay, I can keep talking. Um, we had, there was a family named A. Martin in, um, in Moreland Springs that had two students. Two students in the household. <laughs> and um, he's kind of a mystery patron. I couldn't find anything about him. You know, I've, I've just been going on Ancestry and Find a Grave and, you know, kind of doing the usual genealogical searches. But what's interesting about him was his two outing students, um, Thomas Mason and Theodore Williams. Mason was Chippewa and Ted Williams was Tuscarora. Oh, it's there. Um, they only were there for like two weeks and, and a month. They came to the household the same time, and I'm assuming it was a farm. So this gentleman probably needed help for, you know, uh, harvest or something, I mean, in June of 1900. So he got two boys in the household, one stayed two weeks, one stayed a month, and that was it. No more outings for this family, so. Um, Robert Middleton was another one of the Boiling Springs farmers. He owned an orchard up on Allenberry Hill. And um, he had nine boys working in his orchards during a seven year period from April 1903 to April 1910. And their ages ranged from 17 to 19. Um, Frank Mount Pleasant's brother Edison was one of those students who was out with that family. 
So, you know, here's some more images from the orchards. That's Grandfather Middleton, Robert H. Middleton. And then you can see the apple uh, shed there. And um, Mr. Middleton is buried in Newville, Pennsylvania, at the Prospect Hill Cemetery. Um, here are some images from the orchards. Uh, the tank house and sprayer. Um, the apples were packed in barrels then at that farm. <laughs> God bless you. Um, then we have E.J. and E.G. Mortar employed two boys in the spring and summer of 1905. Um, two boys, Grover Long and Joseph Loudbeer. Grover Long was president of his class in 1911. And then he was sent out to Northfield, Massachusetts for about two weeks in June of 1907. He didn't graduate from Carlisle. Um, and he ended up in his home community in Miami, Oklahoma. But he went to Northfield, Mass. And I don't know if you all know anything about Northfield, Massachusetts. That's where the Mount Hermon School, preparatory school, is located. And um, you know, that's kind of a she-she private elite school for was for boys. I know up until the 1970s, uh, uh, when we lived on Staten Island, New York, my brother kept getting into trouble and he got sent to the Mount Hermon School because my parents didn't know what to do with them. But there were Indian school boys at the Mount Hermon School, which was a very exclusive private school. And um, we don't know if Grover Long was one of those boys or not, but he could have been. And then um, he, but he didn't graduate. So, you know, that's just kind of an, an unusual, unfinished story right there. Um, Joseph Loudbear graduated from the Carlisle Indian School in 1910, but then he was expelled. And he married a Carlisle girl, a Carlisle Indian School girl, Louisa Ketchikam, who was Menominee from Wisconsin in July 1913. Um, Louise had enrolled in Carlisle at age nine, and after being at school for eight months from August until April, spent the next three years out with six different families before she came back to Carlisle and then was expelled. So then they, they both were expelled, and they were married. So, you know, you can kind of guess what might have happened there. <laughs> or not. Um, uh, and so Charles Otto and his wife Sally, these are all the outings that were uh, in his household. He, he had the most outings of anyone in Boiling Springs. Um, and they were in their early 40s, according to the 1900 census. Um, they had 16 boys on 17 different outings. So they had a boy who came back a nut for another outing on their farm. Uh, and that was from April 1901 till August of 1907. And of this group who ultimately left the Indian school, uh, nine left because their terms had expired. Two ran away, one was expelled, two graduated, one became an employee of the school, and one transferred to college after learning to become fluent in English. Turns out that child, young man, was Edward Pascarell, who was from the, quote, Puerto Rican tribe. There were about 50 kids from the Puerto Rican tribe who were sent to the Carlisle Indian School in 1898 during the um, Spanish-American War. Um, and they didn't speak English at all. And so this kid, who was very bright, just came, learned English, and then was transferred to college. So that's a unique story for sure. Eugene Chiago, who was also in the auto home, he was from Sacaton, Arizona. He arrived in February um, of 1895 at age 18, and he left because his time expired in 1901, six years later. He had five outings. The final with Charles Otto from April 8th, 1901 to July 1st, 1901, uh, just before returning to Arizona. He wrote to the school after his return telling about his broken leg due to a fall off his horse. He remarked that when he got back to Arizona, he, quote, felt lost, end quote, 
because there were so many improvements to his home. It was a different place. His father had been baptized and changed his surname to Hayes, and then Eugene changed his own name to Eugene Hayes after returning home. So Eugene Chiago at Carlisle became Eugene Hayes um, when he went back to the Pima community. So, you know, that's kind of the naming in reverse story because we all know that kids who came to Carlisle, they had very, um, if they had foreign sounding names, especially those Lakota kids who came from the Rosebud and Pine Ridge Res, their names were changed to English sounding names at Carlisle. Um, these are the two extremes who lived with the Otto family. The kid, John Jackson, who sent a postcard to the school um, saying, I'll be home tonight sometime. I wish you success in whatever you undertake. Goodbye from your friend John Jackson, September 6, 1913. Well, he went to the Ottos March 29, 1904, and he left the Ottos March 29, 1904. Um, he lasted one day ran home. Um, and then Brig George had, he lived with the autos for over a year. So again, you know, you have this real extreme <coughs> and diversity in the experience at these outings. Jay Pressel, um, I found information about him uh, on Find a Grave, and that's all I could find. I, I was looking in uh, Indian school newspapers for references to these folks, newspapers.com for references to these folks, and I'm, I'm really hoping that you know, all you Boiling Springs people who have contacts in Boiling Springs might be able to you know, recognize names or share names with people so we can maybe put together uh, some kind of sense of who these families were, and if they knew that these children were in their homes. Um, a lot of times families don't know at all, so spread the word that, you know, this stuff is out there. Uh, Jay Pressel, he employed one 19-year-old student for the summer of 1892 as per the Boiling Springs address in the records, and that was Moses McClellan, who became ill at the Indian school and had to return to Michigan before completing his time. Uh, the Pressel outing was Moses' only country home. Pressel also had three other students, but the address was Allen, Pennsylvania. So, you know, we're going to find on, on my spreadsheet families that might be identified in one town. Um, for example, Boiling Springs, but then they might really be identified as Churchtown because their farm might have been in between those places. So, you know, that's another thing that we're coming across doing this kind of research. Uh, Clell Ritter couldn't find anything about him. Uh, he, he had Henry Standing Elk in his home um, from June 1911 to September 1911, just three months. And that was Henry Standing Elk's first outing, <clears throat> and then he had Henry, Henry had three more outings before he was sent home. And John Vincent Souter and his wife, Annetta Bayshore Souter, they are buried in the Mount Zion Cemetery in Churchtown. And Louis Tarbell lived with them for three summers in a row, 1904, 1905, and 1906. And his brother, Peter, also was in the household at the same time as Louis. Um, the Tarbells, and there were two other uh, kids in their outing, obviously in their outing, that had outing with the Souter family. Um, but the Tarbells, um, we, we sell a book in our bookstore called Sweetgrass Basket by Marlene Carvel. Marlene Carvel's husband, who was, a, a, who was Carvel, was a Tarbell. And some of the Tarbells moved off the Mohawk Res up in upstate New York because of the hardship of being Indian up in that area. And so they changed their name from Tarbell to Carvel. So we have this lovely book, Sweet Grass Basket, by Marlene Carvel. If any of you want to share a very sweet story with your kids or grandkids, 
It's the story of two girls who came to the Indian school, and the informant for Marlene's story was Maggie Tarbell. Maggie Tarbell, and you all have heard me talk about her, I'm sure, um, but if you haven't, she was the last living student from the Carlisle Indian School. She died in um, 2001, just before she turned 100. And if any of you remember the Pow Wow 2000 that we had over, was anybody at Pow Wow 2000? Okay, so um, at Pow Wow 2000, these um, three young Mohawk uh, sisters and brothers came and were talking to me about their grandma, uh, Maggie Tarbell, who was in a nursing home up in New York State. And they said, you know, we really want you to come and talk to her because she's, she can tell you stories about the Indian school. So a couple of us went up to visit her and we went up with a tape recorder. We went to the nursing home and Maggie was sitting at a table with her two daughters and these three grandchildren. And I went with um, Dr. Fearsegal, Jackie Fearsegal, who's written a, who has written a book about the Indian school called White Man's Club. And so we visited her, and we were sitting around a table, and she was telling us stories about the Carlisle Indian School. And, you know, we realized very quickly that she was, she thought of us as two teachers who were coming to check on her, basically. <laughs> you know, these two white ladies come up and ask her questions about what was going on at the school. So whenever we would ask her anything, she would say, but it was a good school and I got a good education there. So we would say, Maggie, you know, what did you do for fun? And she said, oh, we'd sneak up in our rooms late at night and talk Indian. Uh -huh. but, we, but it was a good school and I got a good uh -huh. education there. And we said, well, weren't you scared? Weren't you lonely? You know, your, your mother had just died and your brothers were all sent to the Thomas Indian School and you had go by train all by yourself, all the way down to Carlisle. And she said, oh yeah, I was so homesick, but it was a good school and I got a good education there. So she, you know, was an example of keeping that line, following that line to the end, and she did. And she talked about how, when she said we talk Indian, her grandkids and her kids said, but you never taught us Indian. And she said, that was for your own good. And, you know, it was really a very poignant moment. Um, she, after she left Carlisle, she left when the school closed in 1918, and she um, went to Syracuse and worked there. Then she went back up to the res, and she married about five different men who all died. So her name is like Maggie Tarbell Cook Lazor. Um, and um, she worked for the courts translating because she could speak good English. And so she said they would call me in the middle of the night to come when they would arrest someone and uh, I would translate for them and then before I left I'd say, and he's very sorry for what he did. He would never do it again. So you know, Maggie was our ambassador from Carlisle and we actually got to meet her and talk with her. So that was Pretty amazing. And uh, there are a lot of tar bells that are still up there on the Mohawk Res. But I digress. But I'm on my last family from um, Boiling Springs. A.M. Wise, who was a tinsmith, um, and he had a shop on 3rd Street. And he had one student in his shop, Archie Wheelock, who was Oneida from Wisconsin. Um, and Archie arrived in Carlisle in August 1897 at the age of 17. He held the rank of lieutenant by January 1902 and led the A Company to victory in a foot race and a month later was the trainer for his class. Now, Carlisle was a military training school. So whenever anyone came to Carlisle, they would have been assigned a rank and been assigned to a regiment, and uh, I'm not sure how this works, unit, regiment, brigade, you know, all of that was part 
of the structure of how the school was run and the discipline of the school. Maggie Tarbell could, was a captain in her brigade and she marched in the um, inaugural parade of Woodrow Wilson and she remembered the commands that she gave her girls. She was really proud of that fact. So here you have uh, this young man who, Archie Wheelock, who's in the home of um, Mr. Wise, who happens to be, I don't know if it's okay to divulge this, but his granddaughter is Pat Strickler. Some of you may know Pat, who's a member and very involved in, with us here. Um, I don't, I guess she's not here, but anyways, um, so he was assigned and he, he ran the foot race. The school newspaper reports show him to have been responsible for overseeing 28 boys while he worked as a janitor in the school building in January 1903. And um, he had five outings before he ran away from the Indian school, May 16th, 1903. And then he married another Carlisle student, Rosa Harris, in South Carolina. Um, and so, you know, there's another example of a Carlisle Indian School student marrying another Carlisle Indian School student. And um, Rosa wrote back to the Indian School that they were living in Roddy, South Carolina. She was a housekeeper. They owned their own house. Um, and stock and land, and she said, I am doing all I can to uplift my people by setting a good example, letting them see what Carlisle has done for me and have always encouraged the education of the young people. I have been married six years and spend two years in the capital city. We returned home recently and my husband is now in business as a merchant and farmer. We are getting along very nicely. So I think um, before I ju be, I just want to quickly show you all. Let's see if I can do this. Maybe not. Um, did you ask me to work? Oh, I did. Okay. Well, I might lose it again too. But what I wanted you to see was that you all have access to almost all of this information through the Dickinson Project site, and I would encourage you if you want to know more, to explore this website. Uh, you go to carlisleindian.dickinson.edu. If you want, we can give you a flyer. We have a flyer with the URL on it. And I just, you know, before I start, I thought, well, I'll just do a quick search for Boiling Springs to see what pops up. If you are from Boiling Springs and want to explore this on your own, you know, if you put it in quotes, if you know how to do searches, you want to put it in quotes, otherwise it'll look for anything that says boiling or springs, right? Um, same if you, if you use our past perfect catalog system. But, you know, it will give you all kinds of variety of, of uh, sources that we use to draw our interpretation of what happened at the Carlisle School. So I just want to make sure you see that before we close up here. And thank you for your attention. Uh, look at the lights on.